So we're going to have a, a, a brief presentation to start off with, and then uh, a panel panel session on the Open Agile Architecture Framework. So to introduce our, our speaker and panelists, uh, our, our speaker this morning is uh, Frederick Lee, who is the Associate Director of Corporate Technology Office at DXC Technologies. Frederick lead, uh, is leading the development of DXC's new Agile Architecture Framework and has over 25 years experience with significant expertise in technology, strategy, enterprise architecture, lean, agile, and digital. And after Frederick's presentation, the, the, the panelists um, we have, we uh, are, their, their pictures are on the screen. We have Thierry Fraude, who is the enterprise architect for IT at Group Michelin IT. Thierry has for the last three years been working as an enterprise architect for the IT department at Michelin where his main focus is to develop the long-term IT technologies, articulate transformation roadmap, and deploy IT capabilities to support business strategy and priorities, and to support innovative thinking. Also, we have Antoine Longjean, Chief Innovation Officer at Mega International. Antoine has contributed to the foundation of the HOPEX Enterprise Architecture Toolset, and is also involved in standards organizations such as the Open Group and OMG. Long-time contributors, welcome, Antoine. We have welcome back to uh, Peter Haviland, Chief Technology Officer at Latitude Financial Services. Peter has almost three decades of experience spanning financial services, management consultancy, technology, and energy. He's currently CTO of NeoBank Latitude Financial Services and is focused upon leading the digi digital and agile transformation of the company. He served as the Vice Chair of the Open Group Architecture Forum and as a member of the Open Group Governing Board, a reflection of his passion to stop solving the same problems over and over again and to help enterprises transform and grow. And also we have, <clears throat> last but by no means least, Paddy Fagan, who is STSM Chief Architect Watson Care Manager Development at IBM Watson Health. Paddy is an expert in the architecture and design of enterprise business applications working across software as a service and on-premise solutions in healthcare and government. So welcome to all of our panelists. Um, and Frederick, I'm going to hand over to you for a, for a few introductory slides. Thank you. So the AF team uh, has talked to many architects uh, and uh, those architects working for large enterprises who are deploying uh, agile at scale. And most of those architects said that uh, the shift to Agile impacted them. Slide 2 contains a small sample of the FEBA teams we've heard. Uh, I think everyone can uh, read them. Uh, the bottom line is that architects are challenged. The processes are casted as being waterfall. Their technology skills are questioned. And their ways of working are our challenge as not agile. Uh, the net is that uh, in that agile at scale world, uh, architecture is uh, too often neglected. Uh, so we, we've gathered some evidence from the field uh, from those large enterprises. Uh, when agile scale succeeds, uh, we get sometimes hundreds of autonomous teams that run in parallel. And if the enterprise neglects the actual discipline, and I'm talking here about discipline, uh, not necessarily uh, the traditional role of the architect, it has consequences. Uh, first, uh, when the boundaries that separate teams are not well defined, we can either have redundant work or uh, we can have blind spots. And when that happens, uh, it translates into missing pieces that has a bad impact on the quality of customer experience, but also on security or even safety. The second point is that uh, uh, when the enterprise and its system are not popular enough, uh, it results in many explicit and implicit dependencies, and that seriously slows down CI/CD pipeline. So. Uh, the, one of the main outcomes of agility, which is, uh, is not there, and it also causes integration problems uh, down the road. 
uh, when independently developed components do not interpret nicely. And we've seen major actual uh, refactoring which jeopardize the economy of, of those transformations. The puzzle image on the left uh, illustrates uh, those integration problems. Uh, third point, uh, traditionally shared assets are identified by the enterprise architect in a top manner and imposed in a common and control style with, with uh, actual committees and so forth. This no longer works. So we need new actual practices to drive the creation of shared assets uh, such as, uh, for instance, digital uh, platforms. And the uh, last point, uh, though IT strategy claims it drives alignment with the business, uh, we see at the same time uh, too often uh, the business creating target operating models uh, that uh, have uh, few, if any, IT uh, involvement or inputs. Uh, so we think that agile scale processes are not enough. Enterprises need new, uh, a new actual framework, and our group has created one, uh, the Open Agile Actual Framework. And I'm going to introduce in a few words uh, what it is all about. Oh, uh, so that uh, uh, holistic uh, framework breaks down the silo that separates uh, business and IT. It's not just uh, business and IT alignment. We have also extended the scope of the classical enterprise architecture to cover experience design, uh, top left, uh, product architecture, operations architecture, and software architecture. Uh, which was not traditionally uh, in scope of enterprise architecture. We have shifted from a requirement-centric framework to a value-driven framework. We complement iteration with set-based concurrent engineering. And uh, that uh, extension of the scope uh, helps us target new personas, and we have developed specific value propositions for each of them. I'm not going for the sake of time to go through each of them. Uh, let's say that uh, the panelists we have assembled today have contributed to the Agile Action Framework through their participation to workshops and or offering work. Our goal today is to start a conversation, which I hope will motivate you to read the OF document and start applying the framework to guide your digital and agile transformation. Still, I suggest we start the panel now. That's great, Frederick. Thank you for the introduction. And uh, if all the panelists uh, are available, um, I can see at least a couple on video. Video, if you can. Uh, if you're not in a good place to do that, then uh, then understood. Um, your answers are more important. But welcome, welcome, gentlemen. So uh, Frederick's given us some um, some context and some some introduction to the to the topic. And you know. Digital transformation, um, agility, top of everybody's mind right now. Um, is, digital, is digital transformation primarily or only a, a front end endeavor? Um, let, let me pick on you, Pete, since I haven't been able to for a while. Steve, I was, I was, I was hoping I, I couldn't wait, mate. I was expecting it. Um, hello from sunny Australia. I just, I probably don't need those though because it's. In the middle of the night here, so um, is it a is, is it a front end only endeavour? Yeah. Um, I I don't think it is uh, anymore. You know, I think maybe a couple of years ago you probably saw people trying to um, use those terms, but really when you looked at the work, what you were looking at was yeah, it was a little bit uh, looked like a lot of the omni-channel type projects um, of a couple of years ago. Um, I think from a management point of view or a company point of view, the entire value of digital transformation um, these days is to actually go full stack and go into the core. Um, in addition to that front end layer, that's usually where the next generation of value lies. Um, and so as a result of that, I think that's something that the framework is trying to address because there isn't a great deal of material out there that actually talks about some of these topics in this context. Uh, so we have a lot of customer-centric design methods, 
where all the you know, um, approaches like domain-driven design or independent services, which might cover more of the technical side. But what we don't have is something that actually covers <coughs> all of those areas in addition to the operating environment that you need, as well as the implementation methodology that you need. Right. So short answer, no, it's ridiculous. <laughs> Next question. Okay. All right. Well, there you go. Thank you. Um, let, let's see. Um, maybe one, maybe this one's for you, Thierry, um, as a, another uh, customer organization. What do you think people talk about a bimodal uh, operating model? Um, what, what, in your experience, what do you, what do you think of the limits of such a model? Um, you know, one for the system of record and one for the system of engagement. Hi, everybody. Um, uh, so, sorry to not uh, enable the video, but I need to uh, to limit my bandwidth. So, um, okay. So, uh, so really, Bimondal really is for me uh, the practice of managing uh, uh, two, two separate uh, modes of IT delivery. So, mode one is, uh, I would say, the traditional one and phasing on uh, accuracy and stability. And, and usually the way of working is based on, on what are called predictive approach. And the management model is uh, more control and command style. And the mode two is, uh, of course, uh, uh, exploratory uh, and phasing uh, agility and speed. The way of working, uh, obviously, is based on agile and DevOps uh, adaptive approach. and. Um, the, the management model is based, is based on empowerment and leadership mindset. So, and usually what we see is that we, we recommend to start deploy uh, the, the mode two, the agile way, uh, uh, on a system of engagement or system of innovation because they are the one subject to um, continuous flow of change and, and need to, to change rapidly. And uh, mode one is considering more efficient for uh, system of record for ERP uh, service delivery, for example. But um, for me, it's, it's quite strange to, to have this kind of um, two separate world because uh, how we can ask our people to change and, and believe in the value of an agile principle one day because they are working on uh, on project uh, on uh, on system of innovation, for example. And the next day, um, we ask them to believe in the opposite because they are moving to a team delivering services uh, around the uh, around the RP, for for example. So for me, it doesn't really make sense. And I think in, in make adoption of a new way of working uh, very difficult. Um, also, what I see at least in, in my organization is that uh, systems that um, uh, experience a high tr uh, rate of change are not always as decoupled as we would like from the system of record or for uh, core, core system, if you, if you were, uh, um, as we would like. And finally, our capacity to um, evolve quickly uh, and, and very rapidly um, are limiting by um, our um, ability to also to, to make a quick change to this uh, system. So um, like I think uh, Pete said previously, uh, we need to infuse a digital way of working into the core of our system as well. So I, at the end, I prefer to consider uh, a multimodal delivery model, uh, if you want, where we no, long, no longer have either um, um, agile or uh, waterfall uh, project, but rather uh, agile team with di different level of adoption, different maturity, of course, but sharing the, the same core values and, and the same uh, beliefs. Right. Okay, Jerry. Anyone, anything to, to add to that? Or I can move to the next question if not. Okay. Um, what lessons have you learned from architecting digital platforms? I mean, uh, it's, it's what everyone's trying to do, um, and you guys are, are, are helping your customers do that. And in some cases, you're doing it for your own organizations. Any, any lessons learned from what you've done so far? Um, maybe Pete or Patty or? Oh, um, there, yeah, there are a few, Steve. And I'm just looking at the chat um, with one or two questions. 
the biggest the, the, the biggest thing I think which is worthy of discussion is that um, I think there's a, a much more symbiotic relationship between some of the topics here like there are specific architecture patterns that, that are needed to realize some of these outcomes um, in line with specific implementation approaches which are which uh, go hand in hand with those patterns right or maybe the other way around right so I mean it, the, the the idea of a monolithic solution and an agile way of working doesn't really fit. So you start to see these requirements to actually implement this stuff. So the biggest lesson for me is the 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 way that the company is managing itself, um, primarily through its financial management process, um, is 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 very uh, critical to putting the operating environment in place that actually allows you to embark upon an agile implementation method. But if you don't actually know what the architecture patterns are to enable that. You, you, you're going to have issues. So you have this kind of three-legged stool that's kind of got to be balanced in order to actually carry it forward, I think. And I just want to um, comment on some of the questions because some of the some of the questions are around things like cloud, SOA, and REST, and and other um, uh, technological patterns, which invariably facilitate uh, one of those three legs of the stool. Right. Understood. Any other lessons learned from architecting digital platforms? So. I guess I was just going to jump in there, Steve. I, I yeah. mean, I think from my perspective, you know, the other lesson really is that th this is a whole organization thing, right? There's there's no point in, in setting out IT and saying we're going to be agile without thinking about how that affects your relationship with the rest of the organization and finding a way to work together that makes sure that everybody comes on the journey with you and understands the value they get but also the changes that are going to be exposed, right? Nobody likes change. And so there is an, in, in any change, an element of change management. And sometimes, and it probably doesn't suit us necessarily to say that as the IT, but to say that we own that change management piece and we're responsible for, for bringing that change management journey, you know, around to people and bringing them on it with us. And to me, that's the other part of it. And yes, there are lots of technology elements and technical elements, but actually sometimes it's the pieces outside of that, that that bring us outside of our natural areas of expertise that are important to embrace and bring on this journey. And again, it's something we try to capture in the document and express some of right. our experience and so on. Right. And there are some questions coming in from the attendees. Where can they get more information about the document? And I'll um, maybe one of my uh, colleagues from the open group can uh, can dive in and uh, and give some pointers to that in the in the chat channel because uh, obviously. As Frederick said, part of part of this is to inspire interest and inspire people to read the document that uh, a lot of work has gone into. So, let me, let me take another uh, question from from the audience. Um, there's quite a few coming in, but um, uh, this is about roles and responsibilities. What do you think the role and responsibility of EA and enterprise solution architects is in an agile software product centric de delivery organization? So enterprise and solution architects in an agile software product centric delivery organization. Um, I'm, I'm happy to, to share a view. Uh, I think, um, you know, the, the, the role is not that different than the roles they've always played. Um, I think they need to be the vanguard for the new ways of working. They need to be the vanguard to explain those dependencies between the different uh, dimensions in terms of operating environment, implementation method, and then architecture. Um, organizations invariably need uh, a group of people who are willing to get out in front and um, act as sort of mentors and guides and coaches for uh, other parts of the organization, particularly those with less experience around agile. Um, so I think that's that's their primary role. Um, clearly, they, they still need to perform those roles within projects, so solutions need to be architected. Uh, and then you know, multiple projects or even programs need to be supported. Uh, so I think that's where they, they still play. Right. Good, good. Okay. Um, uh, let's pick another one here. Um, let's see. We have um, trying to find one that's uh, short enough to uh, to answer. Um, well, how do you think the statement of solution architecture impacts the view of business architecture? Um, I guess I'll, uh, thanks for the question. I'm not sure. Um, I'll probably. Uh, so again, I think for me, the, so the idea that you have a solution architecture, which is fundamentally made up of autonomous independent components, um, 
should inform your business architecture in, in a similar way. So I think the idea that you are striving for autonomy and you're striving for speed um, through autonomy means that your business architecture should also reflect that. So you should have capabilities within your business which do not have a lot of dependence on others and management approaches which don't require excessive amounts of cross business unit um, management. Um, and in that way, what hopefully you'll have is you, you, you'll have this autonomous uh, operating environment that actually delivers the speed and the responsiveness that the enterprise is after. Right, right. So on on that, you know, capabilities, skills t topic. Uh, another another question that's that's just come in it is um, how do we promote any suggestions for promoting um, and developing business architecture and design skills. Um, and you know agile architecture skills how do how do we uh get people to listen to the fact that uh, that these are skills that organizations need uh well it's a, it's a it's a question i believe uh we've answered here in the open group pretty much every year since i've been involved <laughs> how, do we, how do we get people to listen to us uh uh, I, you know, m maybe there's another little agile, you know, or, or DevOps kind of pearl of wisdom in here, which is just to show people rather than tell them. Yeah. Um, you know, that's probably the the best approach. I think. Uh, you know, start small, pick a business unit, and try and roll it out. Um, it's not easy to try and tell people that you've got a better way of doing things, uh, especially in this environment. Um, I don't know that I've been very successful doing that just personally in my career. It's usually the other way around where I try and carve out some guerrilla fashion uh, project and, uh, and do it that way. Okay. My, my, mind you, uh, I wouldn't want to miss an opportunity to plug another open group framework, the open BA uh, business architecture uh, framework, which um, is actually more concerned with exactly this. So if you haven't, uh, for those who are interested in that, I highly recommend checking that out as well. Yeah, that's right. The, uh, the OBA, the, the business architecture, um, open business architecture document. So they're, they're, they are all available on the on the open group website. And thanks for the plug. So um, let's talk. Um, we're, we're nearly out of time, but let's talk about about lean. You know, people talk about uh, agile digital lean practices. So how does lean management facilitate agile at scale? Do you think maybe one for you, Thierry? Yeah. So at least I can I can share with you what we have done in my company. So. Uh, uh, we, we all know that um, su succeeding in, uh, in agile at scale uh, transformation needs uh, manager leadership. I mean, manager leadership is central to, to the change. And uh, and let's see, the, the first years, we, we didn't do much coaching and support for, for the manager. And manager uh, uh, was not really involved in, in a way. Uh, I mean, uh, agile was seen by them as a method for developer, you, you see what I mean. And so to help the manager, um, we have um, uh, equip, equip them with lean management system because uh, uh, lean management system uh, as agile and, and DevOps share the same body of knowledge. They share the same key principle like uh, continuous improvement, like uh, building quality, like uh, empowering people. And um, uh, lean management system has, of course, a long history. It takes its roots in, in, in Toyota production system. It comes with a large toolbox that allow manager, manager, I think, to easily move from, uh, I would say, concept to, to practice in their day-to-day -day management uh, roles. And uh, so really for us, lean management system help us to, to, um, to encourage, if you want, the, the behavioral chiefs require and, and we use it as uh, the primary method of sustaining our agile transformation in my in my company. Okay, thank you. Okay, we're we're just about out of time, but I'm just going to take one one last question. Um, many large companies today still follow a vision, uh, uh, you know, plans. Um, you know, does that defeat agile architecture, or does it increase the need for it? Paddy, you're mm -hmm. smiling. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I obviously, given I work for a very large corporation, I guess, and I, I, I think, I think it can defeat it. I think it can defeat it if you allow it to. But I think, you know, to me, the the answer there is is in is in sort of treating those global visions or grand plans as constraints and say, how do we be, achieve agility within this? Yes, this is the vision that we need to deliver, 
but how do we set ourselves up within that, given that constraint, to, to deliver in an agile way, to operate in an agile way, to evolve in an agile way? Because again, you know, even from my own experience, the thing about these grand visions is they're not immune from change themselves. And, and so, so what you need to do is, 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 is sort of deliver to that vision because that is what you've been asked to do, but yet to retain that agility so that when the vision evolves or changes or however it's described at the point where it, it, it happens, you know, that you're set to do it. So I think, yes, that's there, but I think, you know, it, it just becomes one of those constraints that you encode into your process and say, you know, this is just part of us being us and doing what we do. It doesn't stop us operating in this way, but we just need to be informed by it. And, and, and that to me is a way to, to bridge the gap between the two. That's a great, great answer. Thank you. I mean, it gets us in, right into the whole, you know, corporate ag agility versus, you know, agile development methods and all, all of that area. But it's uh, a, a big, a big topic, but that's a, that's a great answer. Thank you. Gentlemen, in the interest of time, we're going to have to leave it there. I'm afraid there are some other um, questions in the Q&A. If any of you uh, feel so inclined to answer them, then uh, then please do. But um, we're going to have to move on to the next. But thank you all.